Welcome everybody. I'll wait a minute or so as you're all entering into the room and then we'll get started. Grab a cuppa and uh, we'll just be a minute or so and then we'll begin. Good morning and welcome. I'm just waiting a minute or so to allow everybody to join in and we'll get started shortly. All right, I think uh, I think we'll get started and as people join in, they can pick up where we are at and as always you'll be able to access the notes and uh, listen to my webinar on catch up as well. So welcome to today's webinar. I'm Brenda. It's lovely to have you join me today and today we're going to talk about blood pressure and cholesterol and what you can do to support yourself and your cardiovascular system in general. So, as I said a moment ago, I'd like to warmly welcome each of you to my talk today. And I have to say that cardiovascular health is an absolute passion of mine. And I'm delighted to be speaking about it with you today. After all, we are talking about our hearts, the part of us that gives us the ability to love and it needs to be loved in return. And there is so much that we can do to support the health and functioning of our heart. And I hope as always that you find the information presented today enjoyable and helpful as well. My aims for today's brief talks are, I'm just moving this up here so that I can actually see my screen a little better. There we go. There we go. So my aims of today's talk are to explain the multifactorial picture of high blood pressure and show you ways to literally ease the pressure in your pipes, to debunk some cholesterol myths and explain why cholesterol is necessary, to give you nutritional and dietary recommendations to support you, and to discuss the importance of lifestyle measures to support your cardiovascular health. And as always, to share how you can continue to enjoy a cup of coffee or herbal tea, of course, and a piece of delicious cake. What I'd like to say as well is you are more than welcome to write any of your questions down in the chat section and I'll stop regularly during my talk to answer as many of the questions as I can. All right. Approximately 90%... No, I've gone ahead. Here we go. Heart disease is the major cause of death worldwide and heart, stroke and vascular diseases unfortunately kill more Australians than any other disease group. This is despite all the low fat diets, cholesterol lowering drugs, multiple antihypertensive medications and surgical techniques that are the primary treatments recommended and prescribed. There is increasing evidence to contraindicate, to contradict key points that much assessment and treatment has been based on, that high cholesterol causes heart disease, that reducing blood pressure with medication will reduce death rate and that atherosclerosis cannot be reversed without surgery. We all know that there is an absolute place for medication. With my background in nursing and in intensive care nursing, I completely believe that there is an absolute place for medication. What there also is, is an absolute place for dietary management, lifestyle management, 
and supplements, herbal medicines, other modalities to support the health of your heart and your cardiovascular system, your blood pressure and your cholesterol as well. Approximately 90% of coronary artery of coronary artery heart disease is attributable to factors that are modifiable. That's just literally spectacular because if we know that there is so much that we can all do to support our own heart health, wouldn't you want to do it? And I'm hoping that with today's talk and the things that you learn today, you will already start to get an understanding of some of the things that you can do to support your blood pressure, to support your cholesterol, and to support your heart health. Therefore, you can play an active and crucial role in the care of your heart and significantly decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. Above and below, for those of you who've done webinars with me previously, you'll know that this is a slide that I always have. And I always will have it because blood pressure, cholesterol, any other coronary or heart condition is so much more than what we just see on the surface. We only see the 10%. 90% is going on underneath, creating the symptoms, the problems, the diseases that you're experiencing. And my job, our role, is to help recognize them, educate you about them, and start to treat them. This is a brief snapshot of the multifactorial picture of blood pressure and cholesterol. You'll see in the middle there that I've put blood pressure and cholesterol. We could have put other things there as well. For example, angina is another one that could have gone there. Around the, those terms, blood pressure and cholesterol, are all the different reasons why you may be experiencing the symptom of blood pressure and cholesterol. Up the top, chronic inflammation. Why? Chronic inflammation affects the functioning of every single part of the body. It does. What happens as well is that when there's inflammation in the body, it can become a vicious cycle. More inflammation creates dysfunction. More dysfunction in the body creates more inflammation. So you get this ever increasing bubble or balloon of inflammation that affects everything. What we want to do in nutrition and naturopathy is not suppress the inflammation because inflammation is actually a beneficial thing. What we want to do is help your body regulate the inflammation so that it can do its job and then be released. And inflammation is a key driver of why blood pressure goes up and why plaques can start to form on the linings of your vessels creating potential risk for a heart attack, a stroke, etc. If we go around in a clockwise direction, we then come to obesity. And we know that obesity with insulin resistance, etc., metabolic syndrome, etc., absolutely contribute to problems with blood pressure and heart disease. And it has a direct link with the inflammation because the more inflamed, the more obese. The more obese, the more inflamed. If we do not deal with those basic, basic, basic underlying issues, we're not going to get the result that I know you can get. Of course, Pre-existing conditions, for example, diabetes or renal kidney disease can absolutely have an effect as well. There's inflammation, 
there's insulin resistance, there's what we call oxidative stress or damage, stress on the cells that's causing the cells to become damaged. And damaged cells do not operate well. Therefore, it's easy to see how you can then develop particular conditions. We know absolutely that there is a family history segment involved as well. However, what is important to understand is that just because there's a family history does not mean you will have the same problems. There is a higher potential and a higher risk. One of the aspects that's so important in nutrition and naturopathy is to work out how we can make sure that you don't trigger, that that gene isn't switched on and that you then have those same symptoms and conditions. Or if it does get switched on, we help tone it down. We help your body not have as big a reaction or as big a problem. Gut and liver health, of course, it's the seat of so much along with inflammation. Alcohol and smoking, I'll have a little bit more to say about that also. And of course, which we'll talk about in more detail, diet and nutritional deficiencies. We really are what we eat. Lifestyle and exercise, absolutely essential to modify. And we must never, ever forget, in my humble opinion, the effect that stress and emotional and psychological health will have on our body, our blood pressure, and our cholesterol. With cholesterol, other than genetics, two of the biggest reasons why cholesterol rises is sugar in diet and stress, because stress produces cortisol and you need cholesterol because it's a building block of cortisol. As well, the emotions that we feel will either be tight and constricting, causing blood pressure or the pressure in your pipes to increase, or it can be relaxed, joyful, happy, easing the pressure in your pipes. I hope that as I go through today's talk, you will get a better understanding and a clearer picture of everything that I'm talking about today. So blood pressure, what is happening in your pipes? Blood pressure is a measure of the pressure in your pipes, your circulatory and cardiovascular system. It is a measure of how hard your heart is working at that particular time. In your mind's eye, imagine a hose pipe. Imagine that this pen is a hose pipe. I know it's a bit rigid, but just imagine. What we want is we want this hose pipe to be beautiful, flexible. We want the blood to be able to flow really nicely and smoothly through the pipes. We want the pipes to be able to contract and relax and do their job really nicely for us. Unfortunately, with stress, with ill health, with poor diet, with smoking, with all sorts of other things, that beautiful, flexible pipe can start to become tighter. And it won't be able to do its job as effectively. As it becomes tighter and more constricted, the pressure starts to rise. There's a narrower hole or gap for the blood to move through. So it's registered in your blood pressure measurement of it being higher. If your heart's having to work harder, the pressure goes up. If the blood's not smooth, if there's plaques on the walls, 
there's narrowing, there's constriction. So the pressure isn't easy anymore. The wonderful thing is that while there are absolutely fantastic medications that can help, diet, nutrition, naturopathy, except, excuse me, et cetera, counseling, massage, acupuncture, endless things can help bring the pressure down to release the pressure that's in your pipes. There are many reasons why your blood pressure may be high and it is also significant which of the two numbers is high and by how much. We don't have time with everything I want to go through today to go into that in great detail. That's always something we can look at later. What is important though, is it is important to remember that high blood pressure is only a symptom. While it absolutely needs to be treated because sustained high blood pressure is damaging. It's damaging to so much of the body in, as well as the heart because the heart has to work harder to keep getting the blood out into your body to do the work and that can then create other problems and exacerbate things as well. However, we need to remember it is just a symptom of an underlying problem that needs to be addressed. And while medications, as I've said, can be useful in decreasing your blood pressure, it is essential to consider what else can be done to support the underlying drivers. I hope that the way I've explained that this morning makes sense and resonates with you. And please feel free as always to ask me any questions that you need to. Let's spend a few moments talking about cholesterol now and it's many myths. Number one, this is in no particular order by the way, cholesterol is bad. And unfortunately, cholesterol is often, I believe, misunderstood and maligned. Cholesterol is a fat-like substance that is found in all cells within the body. And it is actually an essential component of cell membranes. It is present in food and partially absorbed by our gut and is also produced by every cell in the body. Some of its functions include being used by our body for the production of hormones, including sex hormones and stress hormones that I, as I've already mentioned, and vitamin D. Other functions as well, these are just some. Importantly, it's the context of the cholesterol that is more important than the level of the cholesterol from my aspect and our aspect. Cholesterol in an inflamed, insulin resistant and unhealthy person or population that we have can be expected to be damaged cholesterol and not great. However, as we know, we need cholesterol. It is commonly thought that LDL cholesterol is the bad one and HDL is the good one. However, healthy unmodified LDL is not as atherogenic as thought and its job is to deliver cholesterol to the tissues to perform vital functions. It is when the LDL cholesterol becomes modified or damaged by inflammation or oxidative stress or insulin resistance that problems may then start to occur. For example, when insulin resistance is present and blood sugar levels are high, healthy LDL becomes 
modified and damaged by the chemical processes that occur because of it, creating the same stimulus to the immune system, causing what we call foam cells that can then damage the lining of the vessels, exacerbating inflammation and creating a vicious cycle of damage, causing those plaques to form. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am so incredibly passionate about this. I need a sip of my water. One moment. Thank you. Causing the plaques to form and grow, eventually decreasing or blocking off blood flow or throwing off clots, causing problems. What is often not realized is that HDL can also become modified and damaged through insulin resistance and inflammation. Its role is to pick up cholesterol from the periphery, from the areas of the body and return it to that wonderful organ, the liver, for recycling or excretion which is also why liver health is so important and why it absolutely needs to be considered when we're looking at the overall picture of cholesterol. HDL is also anti-inflammatory, promotes the health of the tissues and protects LDL from oxidation. Other conditions are also associated with damaged LDL and HDL and can include sleep apnea, diabetes, hypothyroidism, chronic kidney disease, and of course, obesity. Because as I've written there, it's due to those underlying drivers of inflammation, insulin resistance, and oxidative stress. Number two. Dietary cholesterol affects your cholesterol level. It used to be thought that the more dietary cholesterol you consumed, the more your cholesterol levels would rise or would rise. Error there, sorry about that. Rise. This is not true. The cholesterol levels in your body are not as affected by the actual cholesterol you eat as was once thought. However, diet is still considered an important factor in raising or lowering good and bad cholesterol, just not dietary cholesterol specifically. It is the amount of saturated fats, trans fats, simple sugars and sodium you consume that affects your cholesterol level more than dietary cholesterol. So when you buy a vegetable oil or you buy something that says no cholesterol, still consider whether you should be buying it because what type of fat is it? And that is the key factor to consider. Eating eggs is bad for cholesterol. I love eggs. I hope you love eggs too. This myth ties into the previous one and is not true. Eggs that were once thought to be a key culprit in contributing to high cholesterol are no longer the enemy we thought they were. They're a fantastic source of protein. They're a fantastic source of many, many nutrients. And eggs can be enjoyed. Diet is the only important risk factor for high cholesterol. This also is not true. Stress, as I've already mentioned, can also lead to high cholesterol as increased cholesterol is produced for the production of stress hormones. High stress, high cholesterol. You take a statin, it will decrease your cholesterol. You may find that you are somebody who even, who as your cholesterol lowers, become 
more anxious, more stressed, because you may not be producing enough hormones to support you. There are ways that we can assist that. It doesn't mean you have to throw out the drug. There are ways that we can assist. However, we need to take it all into consideration and discuss things with your doctor, with your natural therapy practitioner, whomever they may be. A lack of exercise may also contribute to an unhealthy cholesterol. Exercise is essential. However, you do not have to be hammering yourself at the gym. 30 minutes, five times a week, more than enough. Get the heart rate up, but it doesn't have to be two hours. All you're gonna do is fatigue yourself and stress your body. It needs to be in line with where you are at in your health. High cholesterol is the only risk factor for heart disease. This is false. Other risk factors such as smoking, high blood pressure or diabetes, poor lifestyle, poor diet, um, unrecognized emotion, not dealing with your emotional health, your psychological health, all of those are risk factors for heart disease. All right, let me see what's here. Are there any questions? Not yet, lovely. Okay. Oh, what am I doing? Sorry, folks. Hold on a moment, please bear with me. I am, there we go, thank you. I'm using a new computer and I'm getting used to it. Okay, nutritional and naturopathic treatment. While medications can be very necessary and indeed life-saving, they do not generally treat the underlying cause of the problem. That's where we can come in and work to do so much good for you and your body. While they may also be very valuable in supporting you while you they, where they may also be very valuable is in supporting you while you start doing everything you can to modify your diet and lifestyle and treat the underlying drivers, a process that we all know can take many months or longer. One of the things I often, often say to my clients Please don't look at your medication as the enemy. We all know that we don't want to have to take medication. We get that. There are times though when medication is essential and it's not the enemy. If we can even help change our thinking and feeling towards the medication, so instead of resisting it, fighting it, hating it, but saying thank you or appreciating what it's doing, it can start to work in a completely different way and it can start to let your body know that you're doing something while your body need, does all the other work. I know that might sound a little bit left field, but I wanted to share it because it's something that I spend a lot of time talking about with my clients because so often we hate the medications and every day you take the medication, you're wishing you didn't have to. But if we learn to realize that it can be there to support us while you do the work, it's a different scenario. You cannot out medicate or out supplement your way out of the factors that you need to change. We can't. Your diet, lifestyle, exercise and stress. However, you do not have to do bucket loads to start getting a change and for your body to start reflecting a change back to you. Making one change at a time, two changes at a time and building on that, that's the key. 
It doesn't mean you have to stop having your coffee. It doesn't mean you have to stop having a treat every day. Sometimes there are clients that I'll say to them, we're not even gonna touch the chocolate today because I know that if there's an emotional or psychological connection to the chocolate, if you stop the chocolate, what's it gonna do? Cause more stress. What's that gonna do? Increase the pressure in your pipes. I understand that it's sugar and that that's not so great, but we help the body deal with that. Because if we ever feel we're being deprived, it's just going to create stress. The power of diet and lifestyle intervention is unfortunately not often given the spotlight and power it deserves. I would love to shout it from the rooftops, radio, television, anywhere, that people start to learn the power of diet and lifestyle and why. Our nutritional and naturopathic treatment needs to be aimed at decreasing inflammation because we know that inflammation drives every pathology. Reducing insulin resistance, and it's really important that you know and understand that insulin resistance does not only happen in overweight or obese people, it can absolutely happen in slim people as well. And treating oxidative stress, that stress that occurs where there is an imbalance between the damaging components or free radicals and protective components or antioxidants in your body. These free radicals cause harmful reactions to occur in the body creating more inflammation, etc. And of course, supporting stress management, liver health, immune system health, etc. A complete holistic approach. The importance of a good diet and lifestyle cannot be overstated. Dietary modification is a key foundation of treatment. It is not complicated which foods need to be avoided and which to be enjoyed. And as I always say, and totally understand that the challenge is being motivated and compliant and knowing that it is a long-term lifestyle change. Therefore, if it's a long-term lifestyle change, you need to know you can have treats every day. It's not deprivation. And we will always fall off the wagon. That's okay, we're human. You get back on the wagon, either the same day or the next day. Try not to say, I'll restart next week. That's just building resistance, building stress. If, at that, if on that day you can say, you know what, I've fallen off the wagon today, that's what happened. Don't justify it, you don't need to. You can if you want to, but you don't need to. You acknowledge there and then you've fallen off the wagon, I'm going to get back on the wagon. If there's an emotional thing driving it, that needs to be addressed but that might then need some counselling or it might need some other intervention. I hope everything I'm saying makes sense and uh, I'm just gonna have another sip of water just with my excitement. There we go, okay. I love the heart, I love the heart. All right, let me see if there's some questions now that have come through. Here we go chat okay um there are some questions here um it's okay if you have high cholesterol but cannot tolerate statins there are other ways that we can treat you and as i go through the dietary stuff now 
hopefully I'll be able to help you understand how and there are particular herbal medicines and nutritional supplements that can also help with these webinars i'm not able to give you brand names or particular products at all uh, i'm just not able to do that i can talk about certain things i'm just very aware of what i am and i'm not able to do uh, because of the educational component and the tga requirements okay um, there's some questions in Q&A. All right, let me, I'm a bit concerned because this is a new way, computer way for me. Sorrel, can I ask you, are you able to see the Q&A questions and put them into the chat box for me, the Zoom webinar chat? Would you be able to do that so that I can answer those questions? Thanks, that would be great. Um, there is another question about skim milk. I'll speak about that in just a moment. And uh, also around Weight Watchers um, and weight, okay. And yes, I can show you the circle chart as well. All right, thanks, Sorrel. If you're able to do that, that would be great. Okay, let's talk about the general guidelines. It is ideal to avoid unhealthy saturated fats and trans fats. So foods that commonly contain saturated fats include butter, cream, ice cream, and dairy foods. In answer to your question around skim milk, as a nutritionist, and I'm not a dietitian, so for those of you who've not heard me speak before, I am trained differently to a dietitian. So when you go see a dietitian, they will treat you in a particular way. When you come to see a nutritionist, we will treat you in a particular way. And I believe that dairy is generally unhealthy for most people. It's very mucus forming. The protein structure of cow's dairy is very different to our structure. Goat dairy is more aligned with us. So you're welcome to try goat's milk, goat's cheese, goat's feta, goat's halloumi. But just taking the fat away and having skim milk is still a dairy, a, a cow's product. Now, I know there are people that just love it. So what I would recommend is go A2, because at least with A2 milk, it's one step better. If you are somebody though that has gut problems, mucus problems, sinus problems, I would highly recommend avoiding all cow's milk products. Some people can tolerate yogurt because it's cultured, some can't. So you might find that you're better off doing a different type of yogurt, a sheep's yogurt, a coconut yogurt, some other type of yogurt. There are some people though that are okay with a small amount of plain, full fat Greek yogurt. Emphasis on the full fat because what have they done to the product to make it low fat? A small amount of full fat will be worked with by your body in a totally different way to low fat. Processed foods such as biscuits, cakes, pastries, pies, and takeaway foods. Straight out, saturated, unhealthy trans fats. However, we all know that we enjoy takeaway food. I know I do at times when, you know, I'll look at the kitchen and I'll just say, not today. We all like a cake. We all like a biscuit. It's the type that we have. There are healthy takeaway options that do not need to be loaded with fat and sugar. The same with biscuits and cakes. 
fat on meat and the skin on chicken and other poultry. We all know that the fat is what gives a lot of the food the flavour. If you want to cook with the fat on, go right ahead, but don't eat it once it's cooked. Just cut that part away. If you are happy to go lean, go lean. That's great as well. Processed or deli style meats, for example, salami. And I know we're all big fans of deli style meats. Unfortunately, the vast majority are just not good. I'm sorry to say, and I, it's really important to me for my own ethics and my own integrity that I give you the truth. What you then choose to do, totally up to you, no judgment, no judgment at all. Today is about helping you see what things are not so good, what things are better. From there, the choice is yours and to then work, if you want to, with your natural therapy practitioner, whomever they may be, or your doctor, whoever, to make changes. And of course, vegetable oils. Okay. Foods that commonly contain those trans fats include they are naturally found in some foods, such as butter, dairy, and some meat products, but most of them are from processed food, deep fried food, biscuits, cakes, pastries, hamburgers, pizza, hot chips, any food that lists on the label hydrogenated oil or partially hydrogenated vegetable oil, and these also include margarine and other hydrogenated fats like corn, peanut, sunflower, safflower, and soya oils. I'll talk more about the healthy oils shortly. Let me check for, um, here we go. Okay. All right, so the differences, I'll just do this now, um, explain the differences between a dietitian and a nutritionist. Uh, it's in how we're trained. So dietitians are um, science-based trained and work alongside many doctors and orthodox medicine practitioners. The way we're trained in nutrition, which is what I can talk about, is that we understand and are taught about what the body needs in terms of vitamins, minerals, foods to support the overall functioning of the body to address the underlying drivers. A simple example is full fat versus low fat. While low fat might be recommended on one aspect, we will recommend full fat because a little bit of the food in its pure form, unflavored, nothing added to it, the body knows how to deal with unless it's got an intolerance to it. What have they done to the low fat food, to the food to make it low fat? What have they changed? What have they added? How will the body respond to that? We also know, for example, that you need healthy fats in order to support the functioning of the body. Coconut oil, olive oil, etc., etc. So the way that we look at the body differs and the way we see how the body needs its nutrition differs. I generally say to my clients, they're welcome to have an egg a day if they would like to. If they would like to, if they're concerned and they use, like having a couple of eggs, why not have a full egg plus an egg white? 
but we must never forget that the egg yolk has an incredible amount of fat soluble vitamins in there that you can't get without it in the egg so if you're concerned or you're changing an old way of thinking around it have your one egg and then some egg whites if that feels better all right let me try i'm going to try go to the q a i don't know why it's not coming up for me i really don't um if there's a way for those of you who've put a question in the q a would you mind going and writing it in the chat section for me please you should be able to see that i hope so that i can then answer i don't know why i can't get to the q a part i do apologize uh, so if you can do that that would be fantastic all right continuing on salt particularly table salt the reason i say table salt is because all the valuable nutrition the other minerals have been stripped out of it our bodies need salt we also know with cardiovascular health that the amount of salt might need to be decreased when you start having proper salt your body starts working with it really well and you actually don't need very much at all if you're craving salt a couple of things could be going on because you're inflamed your body is what we call acidic that acid alkaline balance isn't very good and you might be craving the salt because you're missing electrolytes to try and balance it out if you've been very stressed your adrenal glands that secrete cortisol and other stress hormones might be craving salt because they're exhausted they might be craving sugar because they're exhausted as well and they're looking for something to give them a bit of an oomph so if you do have table salt i would highly recommend putting that away and if you are going to use salt sea salt proper salt is fantastic wheat wheat in the body generally don't mix unfortunately wheat is very inflammatory acidic sticky and it can actually make the blood and everything in the body quite sticky alcohol i'll talk a little bit more later on more than one coffee a day is generally not recommended and i say that with a smile because i know many people have more than one coffee a day and i've worked with clients that have had up to 12 coffees a day some of them double shots and you cannot just go cold turkey weaning it down is a win say you have four coffees a day go to three that's a win if you have a teaspoon of sugar in your coffee go to half a teaspoon that's a win gradually 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 your body starts to change and to respond generally you do not want to have your coffee first thing in the morning on an empty stomach it is a huge bomb to your body i know you're often doing it as a way of getting you going in the morning you know giving you that kick start to get going but it's actually going bang and causing a shock in your body the ideal time for your coffee to enjoy is morning tea time and when you have coffee before food it can also interfere with the absorption of the nutrition from your food meaning your cells are hungry and of course sugar sugar drives inflammation sugar drives insulin resistance and sugar drives oxidative stress it is labeled in many ways when you look at ingredient labels if you see anything like corn syrup fructose sucrose glucose maltose it's sugar as well as maple syrup honey all those things sugar 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 
We need to try and help people decrease it as much as possible because it is literally hardening your arteries. Artificial sweetness, toxic to the liver. Unhappy liver, more inflammation. Processed and prepackaged foods we've mentioned and soft drinks and energy drinks as well. I saw there were quite a few more questions. Uh, so if you've been putting them in the chat section, I am so grateful, thank you. All right. I'm just gonna move up so that I can see what's what I'm seeing. Okay, with Weight Watchers, Weight Watchers, all the weight loss programs all have a place. What they can do that is very valuable is buy you time. Because they work with their various systems, whether it's points, whether it's calorie counting, any of those things, they can buy you wonderful time to then treat the underlying drivers, the stress, inflammation, insulin resistance, oxidative stress, etc., liver health, that is driving the overall problem. While we do that, you can use those dietary programs, but also implement potentially healthier options. So where it might say a dairy thing, potentially you don't have the dairy thing, you have something else. So that it can all work to support you. It's the same with massively exercising. If you are massively exercising and the weight's not budging, all you are is exhausted, inflamed, insulin resistant, and it doesn't matter how much exercise you do or how much starvation you put yourself through, you're not gonna lose the weight because you've got this tire or this organ around, your, or, or around you of inflammation that is just kind of saying, no way, Jose, you're not budging until I budge. So I hope I explained that. And of course, all of that then helps if you, if we can address all of that, then it makes a difference. I must say though, that when it comes to weight loss, what's very challenging is when you start doing weight loss work where you're addressing the underlying drivers, the scale may not change numbers for weeks, or it may only change by half a kilo because we have to fill the petrol tank properly, not by shocking your body. We have to bring down the inflammation. You may start to notice though that your clothes feel different. You may have more energy. You may feel more alert. Your bowels may work better, even if the number on the scale hasn't changed yet. And that's okay because we're healing you, working with you, from the bottom up. I hope that makes sense the way I've explained that. Okay, I'll come to fish in just a second and answer that. I'll answer that as well as we go. Let me keep going because that might then answer some more questions and then I can come back to the chat. So what are some general guidelines to enjoy? A Mediterranean diet may be very beneficial for many. It is comprised of whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, fish, olives and olive oil, and garlic. This diet is high in monounsaturated fatty acids and has been shown to increase HDL cholesterol plasma levels and reduce the susceptibility to damaging LDL to the damaging of the LDL. Healthy fats include avocados, unsalted raw nuts there, olive oil, coconut oil, and different seeds like pumpkin, sunflower, hemp, and chia. 
the key about the healthy fats and the difficulty to monitor it is in the amount you have. You do not need many. It's not about big handfuls. A small little amount that fits in your palm is enough. And the key is to chew them properly because unfortunately most people chomp and swallow, does nothing. If you're chewing it mindfully, you're releasing the oils, you're releasing everything that you need. And I can tell you that your level of satisfaction and the benefit will be far greater because so many people eat on the run instead of just taking a moment to breathe and chew. Here we go. Omega-3 anti-inflammatory fatty acids that are found in fish like tuna, salmon, trout and sardines. And yes, in answer to the question, there is absolutely a concern about heavy metals and toxicity. There are absolutely brands that you can buy in the health food store, in the freezer section, um, or even in, I've seen in supermarkets, in the fridge, of salmon and trout that is absolutely okay. And tin sardines from the health food store. I think I've actually seen some now. I might have seen some in the health food section of the supermarket, but I just need to double check that actually. Um, where you can actually buy sardines, etc., that are okay. The downside is, of course, they're more expensive, but they are available for you to buy. And then they're plant-based anti-inflammatory fatty acids found in walnuts, linseeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, for example. So if you're having your breakfast, for example, and you're putting your oats or your porridge, whatever is in the bowl with some berries. Why don't you add some, a tablespoon of chia seeds or even make chia porridge. You could add your hemp, a tablespoon of hemp seeds, a couple of walnuts. You've got a wonderful meal right there. Also eating for your cardiovascular health is drink enough water. Cheers, excuse me. Drink enough water. A body cannot function properly if the cells are thirsty. If the body is thirsty, the blood is thirsty. If the blood is thirsty, stickiness, not nice. Things can start clumping together, sticking. Coffee and tea, unfortunately, regular tea, do not count towards your water intake. In the ideal world, you would be drinking one and a half to two liters of water every day. Doesn't all have to be at once, it can be through the day. To support the absorption of water, you could add lemon, you could add lime, you could add magnesium, you could add good electrolytes, you could have coconut water, that's very good. You could do half a glass, half coconut water, fill the rest with water. But a thirsty body does not operate properly at all. Also, eat enough water-soluble fibre that is found in oat bran, not wheat bran, please. Oat bran, barley, unless you have to avoid gluten, nuts, seeds, beans, lentils, peas, and fruits and some fruits and vegetables. However, they must have an adequate water intake through the day. And what they do is they help prevent cholesterol being absorbed from the gut and helping it be eliminated. So you need the water intake but you need those other foods that can support the process. So if you're okay with oats, add some oat bran to your porridge as a suggestion. 
It is also found in psyllium, a common fiber supplement, but do not take psyllium without an adequate water intake. And if you are someone who has suffered or does suffer from constipation, you need to go slower, much slower, with introducing a lot of these water-soluble fibers initially. Because if you are constipated and dehydrated, it's not gonna move the way you would like it to move, which means it's all just gonna build up and create more waste. We have to get you, as I say to my clients, pooping properly. It may mean that you need to take some form of laxative, be it herbal medicine from a practitioner or some other forms that you can buy to actually help get you moving the waste out. Otherwise, it, the cholesterol is not going to come out either. So I'm hoping that I'm showing you that treating all of this is very much a step-by-step -step process. Decreasing inflammation, getting you pooping properly, getting you hydrated, starting to work with the insulin resistance, protecting your cells, working with your stress, so much is involved. It's not about just taking a drug. Important, effective, in support, but not the answer only. Enjoy antioxidant rich foods, including blueberries, spinach, kale, beetroots, all the colors, the greens, the purples, the oranges, to your heart's content. Dark chocolate, 70% or higher, is antioxidant, which is why at night, enjoy some squares of dark chocolate every day, 70% or higher. No guilt, no judgment, enjoyment. Some key nutrients that are essential in supporting blood pressure, cholesterol, and heart health. I've written them down. And I've also then given you foods that they found in. I, I, as I said, I'm not able to recommend particular supplements. That's something you'd need to talk with your health practitioner about. But some of the vital nutrients, and this is only a snapshot, there are others. Magnesium, coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, the omega-3s I've already mentioned with the foods, vitamin D and vitamin K, and potassium. And here you can, I've written some of the reasons why. For example, vitamin K can stop the deposition of calcium in the aorta. It protects fats from damage. It helps to prevent clot formation, and it supports the breakdown of clots. And they're the different foods you'll find vitamin K in. Magnesium is anti-inflammatory. It supports the stress response. It relaxes blood vessels, prevents arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. It's needed for glucose or sugar metabolism. It supports the insulin response and it's vital for energy production. They're the foods that commonly contain magnesium. Vitamin D is anti-inflammatory and absolutely needed for the healthy functioning of the heart. Vitamin D is needed for everything as well, from the immune system to mental health, weight loss, you name it, we need vitamin D. Calcium absorption, bone health, everything. And it's found in your fish liver oils and there you go, egg yolk. And... Uh, all the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are found in those eggs. Vitamin E protects lipids or fats from being damaged. It's anti-inflammatory, antioxidant by doing that, protection and prevention of clots. There's your egg yolk again, as well as nuts and seeds. Coenzyme Q10, it protects fats against damage, it lowers blood pressure, it's essential for energy production, it decreases that stickiness of the blood that I've mentioned a few times today, 
and prevents clot formation. And it also supports the heart in its function. And you, it's fine in fatty fish, organ meats, and a few other foods, as you can see there. And potassium, which helps control blood pressure, support insulin, support the health of the vessels, actual muscle contraction, nerve and heart function, and maintenance of normal water balance. And when you are inflamed, dehydrated, insulin resistant, etc., etc., acidic, your water balance is out. Your cells are thirsty, but you're carrying too much water in the rest of you. So you may find you feel a bit boggy, a bit soggy. You know, you get you wear your watch and there's a big mark. Your ring doesn't come off. Your ankles are swollen. Poor water balance. The good news, it can all be corrected. All right. Lifestyle points, weight reduction where appropriate is essential. Oh, spelling mistake there, sorry. Weight loss is essential to improve insulin signaling and decrease, therefore, insulin resistance. Burn fat, help to lower blood triglycerides and increase those beneficial, healthy HDL levels. Regular exercise is essential. It supports all of the above. Insulin, burning fat, lowering blood triglycerides, etc. And as I said earlier, 30 minutes, five times a week, more than enough to start with. If all you can do is 30 minutes once a week, that's a win. If you are a smoker, stopping smoking is crucial other than it just being a pollutant for your body, tobacco use lowers HDL cholesterol, as well as it's just toxic to the whole cardiovascular system and causes the liver to have to do so much work that it can often mean it doesn't get to do other work to help your overall health. Sleep Good sleep hygiene and adequate sleep is essential for blood pressure and cholesterol health because one, our bodies repair while we are asleep and two, when we are asleep, we are meant to be relaxed and calm and the pressure in the pipes calms down. Stress management. We know that it is ridiculous to say don't stress. It's ridiculous, you can't say that. What we do know is that we can help our body to cope with the stress. Techniques can be learnt to decrease the effect of the stress, shorten the duration of its effect and help the body recover. And of course, there's nutrition, herbal medicine, counseling, Meditation, mindfulness, yoga, tai chi, all the things to manage to help support you. But please remember, and this is why it's so crucial and why naturopaths like myself and all my colleagues spend so much time helping support your stress response is stress equals inflammation plus many other things, which equals high blood pressure, high cholesterol, of the not so good kind. Why there is no magic pill. In my clinical experience, and I've said this every time, and it's, I believe, absolutely true. Unless the underlying issues are addressed and treated, you may not experience as much long-term benefit as you potentially can from treatment. And as each person experiences their symptoms and conditions differently, there is no one solution for everyone. What works for one may not work for another. While one person may be willing to make 10 changes to their diet, one person may only be willing to do one. Both of them, it's okay. It's what is right for you. We are all wonderfully unique. The reasons you are experiencing your current symptoms and conditions are often many and usually, as I'm 
hope you've seen through that diagram, which actually I don't need to go back to because you'll be able to download the notes and keep them and have that diagram there for yourself anytime you want to. Some points to take away and then I'll check questions one more time. I'd like to make a note about coenzyme Q10. If you are on a statin medication for high cholesterol, for example, Lipitor, Crestor, you must, I should have actually put that in capital letters and bold, you must be also on CoQ10. Please talk with your doctor about it as the statin leaches CoQ10 from your body. And you have seen in, pre in my previous slide there how important CoQ10 is for your health and you will not get enough from your diet. And if you are struggling with cramps and those sorts of things as some of the side effects with the CoQ10, with the statin, you may find that the CoQ10, along with some more magnesium and other things, could potentially help those side effects. So if there's one thing only that you take away from today, is that if you are on a statin, you go and talk to your doctor about a CoQ10 supplement. It is crucial, crucial. I'll just take a sip of water. Okay, natural therapies, including diet supplements and herbal medicines may offer treatment strategies to support you and can work alongside your medications. Please know that whatever medications you are on, it's okay. And whatever we do, we can make sure there are no interactions. It is safe. And as always, diet and lifestyle are crucial. Your cardiovascular health cannot be supported by supplements or medications alone. Let me have a brief look at any more questions. Uh, there's a question about overall butter is healthier than margarine. That is true. If you had to do one, a scraping of butter is healthier than margarine. Himalayan salt is fine. Celtic sea salt is fine. I am happy with all of those. Other spreads on your toast could be tahini, avocado, olive oil is delicious a little bit of coconut oil, if you're able to have that. Um, so there are other ways, but overall butter, a scraping of butter is better than margarine because margarine has all those trans hydrogenated fats in it. Okay. If we are worried about mercury, so while salmon is very good because of the omega-3, if we are concerned about mercury, what I generally do, and there are other symptoms that people can have around mercury. If you're ever concerned, one of the best ways to find out what your level of heavy metals are in your body is by doing a hair test. So there are particular companies that test your hair from the root. So if you dye your hair, you have to wait six weeks so that you actually get your own hair growth. And it can then actually show you what your levels of lead, mercury, cadmium, aluminium, etc., as well as all your minerals are in your body. If you're concerned, there are other nutrients, both in food and in supplements that can help bind mercury and remove it, support the removal of it from the body. And there are also nutrients that like vitamin E that can protect the blood from it as well. Iodized table salt is not good 
Uh, it is better than regular table salt, but still not great because all they've done is added iodine to it because they realize that people were becoming very iodine deficient and iodine is needed for the functioning of the thyroid gland, for example, the engine of our body. So you're still better off with sea salt, not iodized table salt. What causes the inflammation, you name it, it can cause it. Pollution, life, stress, poor diet, poor lifestyle, ill health, all of it can cause inflammation. Inflammation can be related to medical issues, but again, that can be looked at. Is lactose-free milk okay? Not necessarily, because while lactose is the sugar component of the milk, it's the protein component, the casein, that is often far more of a problem than the lactose. So just having lactose-free milk will not guarantee that the milk is still okay for you. Um, that's a, for those of you have, that have written questions that I haven't answered, please contact me if you'd like to, because the, there are other medical tests to test for inflammation. However, if you have a test that tests for inflammation and it comes back being showing that the markers of inflammation are normal in your blood test, that does not mean that you do not have inflammation. If you have a chronic illness or you have stress, you have inflammation. So it's a different way of thinking about inflammation and the body. You can download the notes. Uh, Sorrel, do you mind letting everybody know where they'll be able to download the notes? I think from the Denaro, it's in the Denaro website, potentially under my name and the talk. You do not need a prescription for CoQ10. You can go and buy it. Uh, I like I like people on statins though to talk to their doctors about it, to let them know. Um, and you need to be taking at least 150 milligrams a day of CoQ10. Okay. Yes, a supplement as well. You will not get enough just on your skin. You can get CoQ10 from health food stores. Oh, here we go. All these notes will be available on the Denera catch-up section alongside the recording of this video in the next few days. All right. Thank you so much for being with me today. I, I've just looked up at the time and I can see that it's almost 20 past, so I know I've gone over, but I can't help myself. And I absolutely, as you can tell, um, love the cardiovascular system and the heart. So to take away with you, compliance is so important and making one change is enough. And it's a long-term journey. It's a long-term process, which is why slowly, slowly is okay. Thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day today and thank you for taking the time to join me. See you next time. Bye-bye.